Hey there guys, uh, welcome to a short project update stream. So uh, basically, I've got three different projects going on right now. Two that you know about, one that you don't. And I figured I'd just touch base on a couple things since I don't plan on doing a full stream tonight. And there's been a lot going on. So, very simple first thing is, we'll start with this guy because this guy's the most complete project at the moment. This is the motor visualizer add-on extension, whatever you want to call it, for 3D printers. And I went ahead and added these uh, LEDs in here and the little resistors. I said I wasn't going to bother with it, but I decided, ah, why not? So that's a fun little update. But more importantly, uh, working with this, obviously I got all the materials in over the weekend, uh, Sunday. So I was able to start putting together and testing and stuff. First off, I decided that this really does need these through holes right here, these mounting holes. It's really going to need that in order to stay on there. I can leave an option to do it without them, you know, and then you're just going to have to, you know, taper somehow place the, uh, or fix rather the plate, this back plate onto the motor. But it, I really think it's just better to simply put holes in there for it to be mounted uh, using the screws that are there. Uh, although you, I, I, sorry, I say that, but it's, you probably are going to have to swap out for longer screws is my guess. My guess is that Prusa only sends out, you know, exactly the length screws that you need. So you don't actually have the extra meat you need to grab onto here, which because these screws are countersunk on the inside here, the screws going into the motor, the ones that go right here, since those are countersunk, uh, that's, you know, let's say another three millimeters plus the three millimeter wall here. So you're six millimeters short. So unless those screws happen to have an extra six millimeters on them, that's just plain not going to work. So that's something that's going to have to be worked around, unfortunately. Next thing is let's hop over to the camera. Camera, hello. I mocked up the whole entire thing now that I have all my materials. Uh, I'll go ahead and turn this on. First thing you'll notice, blue light, red light is on. You may not be able to see the red light in the camera. It doesn't look like. Uh, just trust me, you can barely see the red light on there. That's probably not that big a deal. The blue light is barely on because right now I don't have the blue light. Or I have the blue light running off of 5 volts. In theory, these guys, yeah, these are my three, uh, what you call it, my three Hall Effect sensors. In theory, these Hall Effect sensors uh are supposed to put out half the voltage that they put in and in fact a little bit less they say the led claims to have a forward voltage of three volts if i got five volts coming in that would be 2.5 so i wouldn't have enough voltage at 2.5 to light up the led I, the forward voltage wouldn't be enough as you can see the blue light is on I put in a voltage divider because without having the red LED plugged into the voltage divider, uh, let me just really quick, where's the red LED? All right, there's the red LED right here. Let me put him over here. So without going through the voltage divider, you see how he goes bright red. His forward voltage is nominally two. It seems like it's actually a little less than two, frankly. So that is the situation. The green LED, it's supposed to be three volts, just like the blue LED, but that seems to be more like 2.7 or something like that, probably. So as you can see, it's not lit up right now, but let me grab a magnet. There's the green one. So the green one's going through the voltage divider right now, and you can see it's still plenty bright enough. So it seems to have a lower voltage, the uh, forward voltage than specified. So basically, long story short is I'm going to have to do multiple to at least two of these voltage dividers. The green, honestly, is not that big of a problem, but I don't know if it's showing up on camera just how bright the blue gets without the voltage, without any voltage divider. And the blue is. Uh... Yeah, anyway, the point being the blue needs to be toned back a little bit. The red's probably all right where it is right now in terms of brightness. Uh, and I only say that because it's about as the red is about as bright as the green when they're both fully active. So if I use that as a baseline, then the only one that's really off is the blue. The blue is extremely bright. 
So the blue right now is not going through a voltage divider. Like I said, it's going to have to go through a voltage divider to bring it down to probably like four volts or something like that to even this out. Uh, so that's that. So we're going to have to add voltage dividers to this d design. Uh, the other things. Okay. The other thing is uh, if you watch here, as I go across here, the, uh, well, two things. One, I bought clear LEDs instead of frosted ones, which is a little bit of a mistake because that doesn't mix the colors as well. Uh, that's not that big of a deal. Two, I'm only barely getting overlap here between each of the colors with this spacing. And this spacing is a little less than the spacing on this guy between here. Now I can bring the spacing a little bit closer in by flipping the, uh, let me use something else to point here. Right here, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, it looks like you can see it. Right here is the uh, Hall effect sensor mounted to the PCB here. And uh, I can flip this upside down to get it closer to the center circle. But that distance there between right here and right here is only about where that is. And therefore, we aren't getting mu very much uh, color mixing, which was what I was saying is the problem. We could solve that by narrowing this through shaft down this through shaft is eight millimeters we could skinny that up and then that would bring the uh magnets where's the magnets at magnets closer to the center and give allow us to also bring all this in closer to the center that is an option but i don't think i'm going to bother and the reason I don't think I'm going to bother is just because this is largely a starting off point. I'd much prefer for me to put this out there and for companies to go, oh, we can print actual PCB boards with surface mount, uh, you know, Hall effect sensors and LEDs, etc. A surface mount RGB LED would be significantly smaller than this. The, surf, uh, the Hall effect sensor is about the same size, but the resistor obviously is also a little bit smaller than this so it would save a lot of space it'd be cheaper for everybody because other people don't have to buy you know a hundred pack of leds instead of you know because they need three of them you know so well four of them actually four of them the point being is that it's better for everybody if these get mass produced so i'd like to see that happen obviously it's my design i'd like to see it take off and that'd be awesome and for that reason, I'm not going to bother trying to optimize this to work perfectly, you know, on this. Now, over to this guy, over to the spinner. Uh, given that, well, basically, what I'm thinking here, the if you watch this magnet going across here, let me put it this way. As I get away from it, already uh, because I'm using the voltage divider, the light already goes down to zero. Without the voltage divider, then you probably could see with a positive and negative side. Uh, the positive pole brings the voltage up. The negative uh, from half voltage from the 2.5 nominal okay, voltage, it goes from 2.5 to 5-ish. It's like 4.7 or something like that, 4.8. With the positive side, and then if you have the negative pole of the magnet, it goes from 2.5, which is your resting point no magnet, down to zero so that's how these hall effect sensors operate and that's why i have two magnets on here the fact of the matter is is that my zero my uh 2.5 quote unquote my middle my no magnet is already zero effectively again you can see the blue light is a little bright and you can see a little bit of the red light again uh you probably can't see it in the mirror the red light or in the uh, camera rather the red light but the red light is there so I'm effectively at zero at the halfway point, quote unquote halfway point, no magnet present. So it doesn't actually make sense to have two magnets in here. So since it doesn't make sense to have two magnets in here, I'm going to go down to one magnet. And I'm going to just make it one of these disc magnets. That way, uh, that way, you know, you only need disc magnets. It was a little silly of me to design this with the magnets I had. I designed it with the magnets I had because I had them, but if I'm going to put this out there for everybody to use, then it doesn't make sense to also have the user buy these magnets to go with this. The user may as well just use this one magnet, uh, use the same magnet that they have for the rest of the stuff. 
and then again we don't need the second magnet because we're already at zero volts with no magnet present so that is a design change i will be making now i've gotten to play with this and uh any other design changes i don't think so so that catches you up on this guy i'm not doing all those design changes live on stream because it just doesn't seem like enough content uh, frankly so that's why i'm just giving you the overview right now so yeah yep that is all the changes for that project and i am staring around my mic so if for the past couple minutes i have sounded a little further away from the mic than i normally do that would be why because i was talking around my mic because again the mic is at the moment staring me right in the face literally right between me and the computer screen so for that reason uh i have a tendency to go like this and talk around the mic because i'm doing stuff with my hands over here all right moving on to the next quick one uh you do not know what this project is because i literally just put this project together this morning uh i bought parts for this project friday or something like that uh, it was probably thursday i screwed up a little bit and forgot to buy one thing that was on sale over the weekend and unfortunately it's no longer on sale so i screwed up a bit on that one and i may just wait till it's on sale again to uh actually do this project to actually show you this project but the reason this is on stream right now is we had a question about overhangs why are overhangs bad so as you can see this was just a quick prototype part so i didn't bother worrying about overhangs or anything like that and you see all that string that's on the inside there and how rough i don't know how well you're gonna let me grab this flashlight if i use this flashlight uh Okay, that was dim mood. I'm trying to see if I can't catch you a little better look at how rough that is on the bottom. And it looks like I'm probably just getting too much glare from the flashlight. But take my word for it, it is extremely rough on the bottom there. Again, just playing around, seeing if I can't get some natural light in there. Not gonna happen, okay. So the bottom side is extra rough. And then you can also see the string that goes across here because this is actually an extreme example of a very poorly designed overhang because it's a circle and i don't know terribly much about the uh how the slicer decides uh, the algorithm the algorithm basically for the slicer to determine layers uh, but it likes to go in long diagonals instead of following the contours so what that means is obviously i've got this hole in the center here so when it's trying to, when it's laying down the first layer of plastic on the other side here, it printed this way up. So when it got to this point, this layer right here, and it started trying to do stuff, it did some layers like this, okay? And some more probably like this, I'm assuming in like this. The problem is, is that it needs a circle and it can't do a circle, you know, it can't just spiral in here basically to get a circle that would be the closest thing it could attempt to do but that's really not going to work because the plastic needs to be fixed at two points and if it's spiraling then that plastic is just going to fall down as it's spiraling that's not going to work so it's basically got to run strands to two edges two opposing edges in order to build out something resembling a circle now obviously by the time it got to the top here it had enough material underneath it to support it so it's actually fine but if you look right here this is maybe the second layer right here it might be the first layer but it's got some extra material just hanging off in here that makes this not a full circle and that's you know something you can expect from bad overhangs like this aside from it just being absolutely horrendously ugly on the inside here again i don't think you can see that terribly well but trust me it is horrendous yeah i can't really get any good light in here i'm planning it's on the to-do list i have a couple of uh uh cheap camera lights that i had from several years ago i've been planning on getting those mounted up on the walls i think to get me some light on the desk coming from these directions because the only one the only light that you're getting right now aside from some natural light through the window which you can see reflected in here but most of your light is coming straight back 
in this direction from this direction from my ceiling light so i need to get some more lights because especially when i'm doodling on the notepad you know i know that there's shadows down here and it makes it a little difficult and especially because my mic you can see right here my mic is casting this shadow as well and that goes all the way up in here so that casts a lot of shadows i'm trying to fix that one so regardless point being is this is why you got to be careful with overhangs because they get heck ugly if you don't design them right and third thing on the list is talking about the palette project the uh printables contest that we're entering now yesterday on my quick stream because i had to run back to the shop to uh throw down another coat of finish on it i said ah yeah you know i'll do this coat of finish today i'll do two goes tomorrow and then we'll be good so uh first thing to point out is this guy right here is not a uh, woodworker and if you've done any amount of woodworking then what i just said about finishes probably you know probably makes a lot of sense that i'm not a woodworker uh one of these things i watch a lot of guys that do wood projects i've only started to watch one guy that's actually a woodworker within the past week or two you know and haven't really watched much from him so uh i underestimated what goes into putting finish on these projects and I did the first two coats just off of the, uh, just off of the can, just what the can said. And the can is not a complete, uh, is not a complete guide to applying finish. Let's put it that way. So I need to add more finish to the, the boards that I've uh, prepped already. And therefore, I'm not going to be able to show you what I'm working with until later on this week. Like, we're talking Friday because it's going to take a few days. So don't expect to see any physical boards on stream uh, anytime soon. In other news, <laughs> uh, we'll have a little bit of story time here. So this guy right here went to the hardware shop to pick up finish. And... One of these things I had listened about finishes. I had listened to a couple of videos uh, detailing what, you know, different types of finishes just to get an idea of what I wanted. And polyurethane, the words I kept on hearing was, well, let me back up. What I wanted was I just wanted a heavy duty finish that was like thick. You know, I wanted one of those things like a old restaurant or outside, uh, you know, table at a fast food restaurant or something like that something with the, like a really thick finish on it and polyurethane every time it came up it was like oh resin plastic and you know i sat there and i was like ah resin like epoxy resin so like really thick plastic you know etc 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 so i said okay polyurethane i'm gonna get polyurethane got to the hardware store first off keep this in mind uh what i'm about to say here i noticed there was a difference between interior and exterior uh, options and I said okay I'm thinking about this being patio furniture so we're going to make sure to pick up the exterior version of the polyurethane but let me look at all the other finishes they have here since I'm here anyway and I decide and you know maybe I change my mind and decide to go with a different finish so I'm looking at all the uh, different finishes and at the end of the day I decide to get a big bucket a full gallon of the polyurethane because i plan on doing more wood projects in the future one of those things the little tiny pint you know i looked at it and i was like i don't even know if that's going to be enough for because again i'm expecting this polyurethane to be a very thick resin uh covering uh finish i'm expecting that to be you know to not even cover my project so i'm like i'm gonna get the gallon plus i'm gonna use it on other projects so it's gonna be cool so uh we get back to the shop i finished sanding the uh well actually no that was sa uh when was that that was sunday morning was that sunday morning that might have been sunday morning sunday morning we get to the shop and i start sanding because i had a uh, broken down and prepped everything before that uh 
started sanding all the boards, finished sanding Saturday afternoon after lunch, head back there, finish sanding, and then go to put the polyurethane on. Open up the polyurethane lid, and that is a heck of a lot woodier, uh, thinner, a lot, heck of a lot less viscous than I was expecting. But I'm like, eh, you know, it's one of those things. I'm not going to jump to conclusions here. Let's go ahead and just slap it on there. So I slap it on there, and it's at this point that I realize, uh, reading back over the instructions one more time because I realized that this is not what I was expecting it to be, that I need to apply the two coats, which is what screwed me up for yesterday's stream because, honestly, I expected to put that one coat on there and to be done. I was expecting it to be super thick, and then I come home, I do like a two, three-hour stream, and we'd be happy. I'm mean, not a three hour stream, probably, probably more like a two hour stream. Point being is that expected to slap this stuff on, let it cure. Oh, until, you know, after work to, today, flip it over and get the other side. That was the game plan. Turns out it's super watery and I'm going to have to come back and put the second coat on two hours later. So that screwed me up. Fast forward to this morning. This morning I get into the shop. And okay, it is just as thin as I as it looked when I first put it on there. Even though I have two two uh, coats on there right now, it is not the solid like millimeter, two millimeter thick plastic coating that I was honestly expecting for heavy duty outdoor use. So I go, ah, uh, okay. Well, I mean, it is what it is. I didn't really do terribly much research here. I probably should have, uh, after I decided polyurethane just based on descriptions, I probably should have actually looked up tutorials and whatnot on how to apply polyurethane, etc. So I would have known better what I was getting myself into. I go and uh, touch the board and I find out uh, what this uh, board appears to be rougher <laughs> than it was when I finished sanding it. It was so rougher after I applied the finish. So... I go and on my break watch a uh, finishing video and find out, oh yeah, um, that actually makes a lot of sense because I've got all this dust in the air from sanding. Some of it's going to get into the board and that's going to, uh, into the finish, that's going to rough it up. So I'm going to have to go back over and sand up the finish and reapply another finish now. And in fact, I'm probably going to have to apply maybe another two or three finishes before I've got a decent finish on this board. So that is explaining to you why you're not going to see these boards until the end of the week, uh, maybe Saturday, maybe Sunday, because it's going to take a lot more finishes than I thought to actually get a decent finish. And even then it's probably not going to be that great just because let's face it, who's not a woodworker? This guy's not a woodworker. So <laughs> One of those things, a lot of effort for something that's probably not going to be as good as somebody else with some uh, actual woodworking experience. Now, rewind, I told you to keep something in mind. I noticed when I went to apply the third coat of polyurethane on today, I noticed something about the can. The thing I told you to remember was, oh... There's interior exterior, and I'm going to make sure to pick up the exterior uh, polyurethane. The polyurethane specific for exterior use. The can I've got is interior use, interior use polyurethane. So uh, one of these things, whoops, uh, but I guess that's what we got now. So I'm not sure exactly how well this is going to hold up in the long run, but one of those things... Uh, We'll get the video done, get the project done, and then we'll see what happens. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that nobody's probably going to be able to tell on the video that it's interior and not exterior use polyurethane. So not that big of a deal, but that was a big oopsie, and I can't believe that after I literally said to myself, okay, make sure to grab the exterior poly, I end up with the interior. So that has been about 25 minutes of me explaining the uh, different projects we got going on and having a little bit of fun story time about my adventures into woodworking here. Uh, thank you all for watching, and I hope you have a great and wonderful day, afternoon, or evening. 
and look forward to the rest of the videos coming out. Uh, one of those things, again, I'm going to be working on this guy right here, getting the uh, this guy sorted out, redesigning this a little bit to uh, incorporate the voltage dividers. So that's first up on the list. Uh, and then uh, probably tomorrow, I guess I'll do another stream of the printables tables, the pallet table projects. I'll probably save that one for either tomorrow or the next day. Again, there's not a huge rush on it just because I'm waiting for the finish to get finished and that's not going to be till the end of the week. So we have a few days to finish actually doing the plastic designs, the uh, 3D printed designs to put that all together. And it's not going it you know, it will take a while to print all the pieces for it, but at the same time it won't take so much time that if I don't get started on let's say Friday printing by Saturday or Sunday when I'm done with the finishes, it won't be done. So uh, I'll do the outro again because I just segued and uh, tangented a whole bunch there. So anyway, thanks again for watching, as I just said. And I do hope you have a great and wonderful day, afternoon, or evening, wherever you're out in the world.